good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are and what time of day it is when you watch this video. My name is Z, and welcome back to my gaming corner. In this, our second episode of Final Fantasy X, we are beginning at the place where we left off at the end of our first episode. Sin just attacked Xanarkand, Titus was in the middle of his Blitzball match, he gets blown out of the arena and ends up here in front of the stadium. So as we walk down this ramp, the scene will change. The we, don't, we don't have any control over the camera in this playthrough because the way that this game was made is you, you can't control the camera with the right joystick. The camera will automatically adjust depending on where your character's at. So that's one limitation of this game, but it, it works. It, it, this game is just so beautiful. And in our last episode, we also talked about how there is this massive theocratical conspiracy going on that we need to understand that'll have us looking at the players in this game a little bit differently because we know what's going on before the characters in the game do. So we're in the middle of Xanarkin. This is the entrance to the stadium. And we come down this ramp and we meet a familiar face. Oren! What are you doing here? What are you talking about? And as soon as I can open the menu and turn off the subtitles, I'm going to do it because the subtitles are so distracting for me. So this is Xanarkand in the middle of the attack by Sin. And you'll notice that water is a huge element in this game. Xanarkand is covered in it. The world is covered in it. But look, you see, you see an arc of water right there it over begins. the city. You see water, waterfalls coming off the buildings. Water is Don't everywhere cry. in this game. Okay, this very first fight and the sequence of the attack on Xanarkand is our tutorial. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry about that. It's air is dusty. Anyway, sorry about that. As I was saying, this first battle and the events of Sin's attack on Xanarkand acts as our tutorial into the battle system of Final Fantasy X. 
unlike previous Final Fantasy games that used the active time battle system or the ATB system where you have a bar that fills up on the character's um, name. When the bar fills up, they can take an action. This one uses the conditional time battle or CTB system, meaning that you can take as long as you want and it is turn-based and you have to strategize how you want to deal with these fights. So as you can see on the right side of the screen, Titus gets to go and then monster C, monster A, then Orin, monster B, and then back to Titus. And if we go R2, we can scroll down and we can see the turn order for all the monsters. So if you kill the monster immediately following you, then you get to go to the next turn, and if it's your party member after that turn, then your party gets to kill all the monsters, and the monsters don't get a turn, so you can strategize your battles in that fashion. Now, Titus's weapons are always swords, and all but, I think, two of them have these hooks on the end of them. It's like the sword has this long blade, and then it has this hook that comes around. And then Orin uses big, giant, two-handed swords. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna need to unlock overdrives and we'll do that as we play through the game. And we're also going to need to save up as much money as we can because there is a certain seller coming up in the story in the somewhat near future that we need to donate to so we can get the best items in the game when we get to closer to the end of the game. So right now, we need to attack Monster C. So where is Monster C? Can I... Really, I can't attack Monster C. I can only attack Monster A. Okay. And then Aran gets to attack Monster B. And then Titus gets to attack Monster C. And we get to run forward. And in this fight right here is where Don't we start to learn strategy. Cut the ones that matter and run. So Aaron tells us, "Don't bother going after all of them. Just cut the ones that matter and run." If you want to be an insane person and grind all the way to level 99 right here, guess what? You can only kill the ones that have shining wings, and you could stay in this fight for hours upon dozens of hours. If you want to. If you want to just grind like that right here, you could. I'm not going to. I'm going to show you a very reasonable way to get through the game, become as powerful as possible, to where when we get to some of the harder fights that are part of the story, we're at a section of the game where we have access to some really, really, really good stuff, like break damage limit, triple overdrive, and Aeons that can hit for 100,000 damage instead of the measly 9,999. And we can just wipe the enemies off the map easy. So we're going to attack the ones that have shiny wings because then they will attack us. And we're gonna try and get through these fights as fast as possible because we don't even get to start earning AP, which will give us our sphere levels until we learn about the sphere grid, and we won't learn about the sphere grid until we get to our next area. So right now, we just need to focus on fighting. Okay, let's, where's the monster A? And then Monster B, I guess they didn't do anything, so... Oh, Overkill, love it. And during this tutorial section, we're also going to learn about Overdrives. So if you attack the three that are in front of you, you move forward. But you could technically just kill all the back ones all you want.
And there is the Sin Spawn. Now, Demi cannot kill you. It can only cut your HP in half, but it cannot kill you. Get but Spines... Some can't wait to die. So here we learn about overdrives. When a character's overdrive gauge beneath the HPMP display is full, that character may use a specially unique attack once. Press right on your D-pad, I'm sorry, left on your D-pad, <laughs> if I could even focus today, um, in the command window to use an overdrive. Okay, so we're gonna use an overdrive on Orin because he has his overdrive gauge full, and it's called Bushido. And the way you use Orin's overdrive is you do a, a sequence of button presses, and if you can do the correct button presses in the time limit, you give Orin the power, the requisite power he needs to destroy the enemies. So here we go. We're going to use Dragon Fang, and the way this one works is down, left, up, right, L1, R1, circle, X. So we're going to go around the left side on the D-pad, go across the top on the bumpers, and then hit the two sides on circle X. So here we go. So it's going to attack everybody on the front row, including the Sin Spawn in the back. And here we go. Dragon Fang. So we have down, left, up, right, L1, R1, circle X. And Dragon Fang looks like this. It kills everybody up front and does decent damage to the guy in the back. So then we attack the guy in the back for 262, and we take off some of his arms, and he casts Demi again. But like I said, Demi cannot kill us. It can only do half damage to our HP, and the lower our HP is, the less damage it does, so Demi can never kill you. So don't worry about it now. But we get to now use Titus's overdrive, and his overdrive is called Swordplay. As Titus does his overdrives in this game, the more he does his overdrives, the more overdrives he unlocks. Okay? We're gonna start with Spiral Cut, but we'll eventually earn all the way up to Blitz Ace, which is his best overdrive move. But we have to use his overdrive in order to unlock subsequent overdrive. So we're going to use sword play, spiral cut, and what's going to happen is a bar is going to appear on the screen and there's going to be a little bar that moves back and forth, left, right, left, right, goes back and forth. What you want to do is press X when that bar is in the middle of the bar. There'll be a little section that's a different color of the bar and you want to hit X right when that bar is right in the middle of the bar. And if you do it right, he does his overdrive with extra power. So here we go. Spiral cut on monster A. Does 368 damage. Very cool, right? Now, you may be tempted to use one of your potions right here, but you really don't need to because Demi cannot kill you. And when we kill all the tentacles on Sin Spawn Ames, we will kill the boss. But as you can see, it just does less and less and less damage to us. And it takes away fewer and fewer hit points every time he does it, because it only halves your HP. It cannot kill you. Okay, there's only one tentacle left. But Arn killed him, very cool. Now there is, if we go back, can we go back? No, we can't go back, but we do get access to our first save sphere on the other side of this boss. Take advantage of it, because when you touch a save sphere, your HP and MP are fully restored. Traveler Safe Sphere Level 1. Stores a record of your travels, also fully restores your party's HP and MP. This is why you didn't need to worry about using any of your potions, because you only get five potions at the beginning of the game. 
just take the demi. It will not. It will not kill you, and you can restore your HP and MP right there at the save sphere. So we're gonna save our game, and I think the recording is gonna pause while we save. Okay, we have saved our game, and let's now go forward to the next part of our story. What are you laughing at, old man? Lauren, let's get out of here! We are expected. Huh? Give me a break, man! Okay, as you can see, there are a couple of enemies that have glowing wings. And when the wings start to glow is when we need to kill them. So we're gonna start with this one in the back that has glowy wings, because we can one-shot them. So there it says, wings start to flicker. So if you don't kill that enemy, on its next turns, he will do a damaging attack called Spines, and it could kill you. So you want to kill the enemy that has flickering wings. So Titus needs to take care of that one whose wings are flickering. There we go. Could be bad. That. Knock it down. What? Trust me, you'll see. Now, this wings, these wings right here are the ones that are flickering, so we need to do an overkill with Auron. And then with Titus, we can hit that thing on the. We can hit this thing right there. start to flicker. We need to take him out. I love the way Titus looks in the cinematics. You are 
true. This is it. This is your story. It all begins here. Hey! Hey! My old man? So, Jekt is Titus's father, and he played for the Xanarchanabes too. But as we will learn, Titus's childhood was not exactly rainbows and skittles. <laughs> His dad ignored him, mistreated him, called him names, basically abused him emotionally. He hit him sometimes, so there's physical abuse there. And Titus hated his dad. Even still hates his dad. And we'll hear about it as the game goes on. And the reason that this game resonated with me when I first played this when I was 18 years old back in 2002 was because my childhood wasn't rainbows and Skittles either. My parents divorced literally right after I was born. And I don't know many people who can remember when they were just newly born or just a few weeks old. Most people I've talked to, their first memories are when they're two or three years old. My first memories are when I was four and I was being chased through the house by my brother. But... As the court documents show, my parents began divorce proceedings in March of 1984. I was born in January of 84. So literally two months after I'm born, my parents began divorce proceedings. So I grew up in a world where I didn't have a father in the house. I had siblings that picked on me because of things my mother told them that I was. And because of the laws in Utah, parents have visitation rights. And so every other weekend and every summer, I had to leave the only home that I knew and go with this person I didn't know who claimed he was my biological father because of his visitation rights. When you're a child growing up in that kind of environment, it messes with you. You don't learn how to create lasting friendships or how to make proper, good, honest, and right connections with other people. It's very hard for you to make friends when you're a kid. You're sort of a, an outcast. You're a pariah. People pick on you. It's just the way the world is. I wish the world was different, but this is the world we live in. And when I had to go with my dad... Sometimes he lived in another state. Sometimes he lived a couple hours down the road. Sometimes he lived across the country. And there were times when I went with my dad that I didn't know if I would ever see my home again. There was a summer that we spent in Las Vegas. And... My dad was nothing but a monster. He abused my siblings. He abused me horrifically. And during the divorce proceedings, there were times when I was in the courtroom and I told the judge exactly what my dad had done to me. But I'm just a little kid. No one believes a little kid. And so nothing was ever done to my dad. When my grandmother passed away, I was seven years old. And at the viewing, I saw him throw my mom across the room of the funeral home. 
literally picked her up and threw her across the room as if she weighed as much as a football. And she hit the other wall with such force that she had to go to the hospital because there were things that were broken and the doctors had to fix it. And I spoke with the attending surgeon several years after the event and he told me that it felt like some divine presence was guiding his hands putting my mom back together in the operating room. My dad beat me. He abused me. He called me names. He said horrible things to me. And there was an even time, there was even times when he tried to kill me and leave me for dead. And no one believed me. Even when the medical reports were given to the judge at the divorce proceedings, no one believed me. And at the end of the divorce proceedings, the judge told all of his kids to come into the courtroom and he said we could pick who we wanted to live with until we were 18 years old, after which we could go our separate ways and do whatever we wanted. All of my siblings chose to go with my dad. And me being a little kid, what would you want if you were a little kid? four, five, six years old. You want your mom, right? Because that was divinely instituted by God. The fathers were supposed to protect the family and provide for his children and his, and his household, and the mothers were supposed to nurture the kids. And so when you are abused by the very people who are supposed to protect you, it screws with your self-esteem, it screws with your image of self-worth. It, Like I said previously, it makes it impossible for you to form lasting connections with other people. And that's the kind of world I grew up in, being isolated from everybody else being left alone for hours upon hours upon hours. Didn't make it fun, didn't make it right. But this is the, this is the, these are the cards that I was dealt, right? So I resonated with Titus and he resonated with me a lot as I played through this game because he had an abusive childhood. He had a father he hated, I hated. And in some respects, I still hate my dad even though he is dead now. He passed away a couple years ago. And frankly, I'm glad that he's gone because it means that he cannot hurt me anymore. So Titus, lives through the attack on his home, gets sucked into this void portal existential place, and he hears his father. So we're going to press circle to go down and continue the story. This looks like the Blitzball Stadium, doesn't it? And as the camera spins around, we should be able to see the platform where Jack stands, and you should be able to see Jack over there on the platform. So yeah, there he is, there's Jack, and we're just gonna swim over to him. But as we get closer, it morphs into Titus's I childhood about form. A lot of things. Like where I was, what I got myself into. I started to feel lightheaded, and then sleepy. I think I had a dream. A dream of being alone. I wanted someone, anyone, beside me. So I didn't have to feel alone anymore. Uh, 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 uh. 
Anybody there? Aaron! Hey! Okay, I can finally open the menu. Subtitles off. Vibration on. And we can also change between the original music and the arranged music. I just think that the original music sounds better than the arranged music. It, because it's the it's the sounds and the music that I remember. So we're gonna go back to the original. We just need to get the subtitles off. So, and then also on curse we need to stay on memory. And then as you can see with like the overdrives, um, we can't change the mode yet. But as we do actions in battle, we'll actually get new overdrive modes, um, like warrior or slayer or whatever. Um, okay, but we can turn the subtitles off. So we lived through we lived through the attack on Xanarkand. We got through our tutorials and we learned a bit about Titus. And I explained why this story resonates with me because Titus's backstory is very similar to my own. So, if you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to give me a thumbs up, rate me a like. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to my channel and click that notification bell so you always know when new content comes out. Also, please tell your friends about me so they can come and they can enjoy these videos and enjoy the adventures just as much as you do. Finally, and most important of all, please remember this. Final Fantasy X is just a game. And games are meant to be fun, and you're supposed to have fun while playing them. So if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. Meet me back here next time when we're going to explore this new environment that we've been thrust into after our encounter with Sin. And see what cool treasures we can get. We're also going to unlock the ability to understand Albed. Yes, I'm aware it would be a better playthrough if I showed you exactly where all the Albed um, dictionaries are so you can learn Albed on your own. But what we're going to do, I'm going to compile the Albed dictionary from a previous game that I played when I got everything and got the Platinum Trophy done. That way we can understand Albed as the story goes on, but I will still make reference to you go into this building and the book will be right here because I have the player's guide for this and so I know exactly where to go and I can stand on the spot. It's like when you come here on your first playthrough, the Albed volume, whatever, will be right here. So pick it up, even though you won't actually see the books in my game because when you play through the story the second time after you've gone through it once and picked up all the Albed journals and you actually get to see what they're saying and you get to see the context of the interaction between the Albed characters that you normally wouldn't be able to understand because you didn't have the books, it makes this game even more intriguing and interesting and it gives more depth and more character development to the story, which makes the story even better. I still regard Final Fantasy X as my most favorite game of all time, including my most favorite Final Fantasy game of all time. The story is incredible. It's a kaiju story, like I said. It's also a story of corrupt theocracy, of a corrupt religion that offers you tangible proof of its validity even though it is an absolute horrific lie and we're going to talk about this religion and this theocracy as we play the game so you understand what's going on as it's happening and you can see just how vile this religion is so I look forward to bringing you 
all that insight and all this content in future episodes. But until then, I'm Z, signing off. <laughs>